I mean, what you're describing in China is, is I would say, uh, my, my worst science fiction dystopian dreams of the last 40 years. My name is Ben Charland, and you're listening to What on Earth is Going On. Today's episode features a panel discussion with three people from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and all of them are previous guests on this podcast. Trisha Baldwin is the director of the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts, and in episode 12, Trisha and I had a conversation about the role the arts play in our society. Elizabeth Goodyear Grant is a professor of political science, and in episode 37, we talked about U.S. politics, specifically women, polarization, and the media. Finally, Daniel Wolf is professor of history and the outgoing principal of Queen's University. He was my guest in episode 10 when we dug into the meaning and the power of history. Today's conversation was recorded in February of 2019. Now, my three guests this week think deeply in diverse backgrounds, but none of them are an expert in the subject at hand. Like my episodes where we use the book as our point of departure, this week's episode is starting from a long-form article in The New Yorker. It's called Yan Langke's Forbidden Satires of China, and it's written by Jiang Fan. And it was published in October of 2018. Now, I've provided a link to this piece in the description, and you can also find it at the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. Keep in mind that you do not need to read the article or any of Jan Lanka's own writing to appreciate our discussion. But if what we talk about motivates you to have a read, then all the better. You might find in the first few minutes of this conversation that we reference the article a few times, but as intended, our dialogue quickly moves past it. We discuss the rise of China, the social and cultural differences between China and the West, the gulf between Western values of individualism and the Eastern values of community, the dreamwalking state that we find ourselves in when scrolling on our phones, the social media credit system of surveillance and control that is being implemented as we speak in China, and that it is not too dissimilar from science fiction or an episode of, say, Black Mirror. We also discuss the dystopian paths down which we may already be marching. And finally, we ask if it's better in the end to know what on earth is going on or to be ignorant of it all. Now for some background, Yan Langke is a widely read and influential Chinese satirical writer, most of whose books are effectively banned in China. Formerly a colonel in the People's Liberation Army, Yan was a professional propagandist before he turned his artistic gaze to the absurdities of the Chinese state and society. His fantastic yet cutting prose is based on the premise that, quote, the reality of China is so outrageous that it defies belief and renders realism inert, close quote. Yan believes that language matters, and this is evident in the New Yorker profile of him that we reference. Jan's body of work since 1980 includes 15 novels, more than 50 novellas, over 40 short stories, three extended essays, five essay collections, six collections of literary criticism, and about a dozen TV and film scripts. For more information about Jan, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, and there you can listen to every other episode of this podcast. You can also connect with me by email or on social media and let me know what you think of this discussion, what your thoughts are. Give me your suggestions also for future guests or topics. And while you're at it, if you like this podcast, please give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever app that you use. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. All right, I'm really excited to be here with Elizabeth Goodyear Grant, Trisha Baldwin, and Daniel Wolf. Uh, we're talking about an article from The New Yorker back in October of 2018 called Yan Lianka, and that's the Chinese name that I'm terrible at pronouncing, and I'm not going to even try it. In Chinese, it's actually like uh, something like uh, Lanke, but I'm not going to try it. So Yan Lianka's Forbidden Satires of China. The print version is actually Great Awakening. Uh, in the, the title in the print version. So before we get to my first question, which is always the same, what on earth is going on? I'm going to ask you each to just quickly introduce yourselves and who you are, and then we're going to get started. So Elizabeth, I'll get start with you. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I am an associate professor of political studies here at Queen's and director of the Institute of Intergovernmental Relations. Perfect. Trisha. 
I'm Trisha Baldwin, the director of the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts. Excellent. And Daniel? I'm Daniel Wolf, uh, principal and vice chancellor of Queen's uh, for another couple of months and uh, soon to be back in the history department as a professor. Perfect. So I picked this article uh, a few months ago for us to discuss because there were some elements of it that really struck me. This persona of the author of Yan Lianka, who is a an author in China who is, so to speak, banned. But banning books in China isn't as clear. It's actually quite an opaque process. Um, censorship is more like self-censorship. Um, there was a time in his life where he had to spend six months in self-criticism because he wrote something that the Communist Party didn't approve of, which to a Westerner is actually quite fascinating. But we do have our own forms of self-censorship here, and there's a parallel there. But of course, there's another aspect of this, which is the rise of China and just how incredibly powerful this country is becoming, but based on foundations that seem, according to this author, quite shaky. So before we get to all of that, though, I'm going to ask you the broad question, um, which is what on earth is going on? And I'm going to ask each and every one of you that question. And you can, you can take this article as part of that question, but really I'm asking about the world at large. It's a deliberately broad question to get a deliberately broad answer. So Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what on earth is going on? Hmm, that's a good question. So as a political scientist, I was, you know, really keenly aware of the um, references to and discussion of communism as a form of government and its impact on the people. And one of the things that really struck me about this article is how adeptly it is at communicating the sort of micro level influences that communism has on people's behavior towards one another, like at the social level. And and they're negative influences for the most part, right? So at various times he describes, for example, um, people feeling as though the only way to get ahead or, or, or to um, um, gain anything is to sort of have an advantage or, mm-hmm. or the upper hand in like a deal or bargain or social interaction. Um, he describes the, uh, this as a sort of, um, I can't remember the Chinese word. So That's it's not it's important. Th- well, the Chinese word is zan pian yi, right. which literally translates to occupy small advantages. But the, the, es- the essence of it is to... Um, be on the sweeter side of the bargain and make sure that no one is pulling a fast one on you. So you better pull a fast one on them. Right. So like it basically, if I could like boil it down is like it creates a system of just bad faith in Mm -hmm. terms of our interaction. So not just social interactions, but actual interactions with one another. Right. And uh, an example that sort of came out for me in the article of that was um, the discussion of the um, sort of personal care worker that Jan had hired for his mother because she refused to move in with one of her children. And basically he says that um, the mother was pestering her and like constantly and working her to the bone because this idea that you wouldn't extract maximum value from what little pay she was getting was not in the Chinese way of thinking under communism. And so it was sort of like extracting work from her for work's sake, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a really sort of probably negative way of treating people, especially someone who's meant to care for his mother. Mm -hmm. And there are other examples like this through the, I mean, the article actually sort of in various ways sort of gets at this kind of, like in some ways, antisocial behavior that develops as a result of the repressiveness of the system, um, the way that the system forces people to like behave in very specified ways because of like in some cases bureaucratic arbitrariness like so it gives anyway it gives a I think a really good glimpse into the way that the system um, causes dysfunction even in the most mundane of social interactions. Right there was a part of the article where um, Jan Lianka essentially says that the the Chinese Communist Party has made it impossible for people to behave ethically without a strict standard given to them by the government. And that's why wherever you don't have government control, things are in absolute chaos, which is not, I mean, which maybe someone in that system would think, well, then you just need more government control. 
But as we know in other systems of government, well, and in fact, you, you've infantilized people. Um, but there's so much in, in, in what you've just said that I'd like to respond to, but I'm going to ask mm -hmm. the question of Trisha next, and then we can get to those things later. Unless, Trisha, it's part of your response. So, Trisha, what on earth is going on? I think the world is going through a huge churn and we're going to see another operating system with uh, great shifts in um, global powers. But I do think that we're going through a very substantial debate about identity and what's the identity in terms of the tyranny of the majority and the identity of groups that um, whose voices were suppressed in, in the past. And so you have the left trying to shine light on on minority points of view and you have the right being threatened and wanting to make sure that America is great again and white again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, just quickly, what, what did you see or read in this article that related to what you just said? Well, the fact that he's questioning authority could be, um, and then he was sent for six months to, to actually um, uh, reflect on what what he had done by questioning authority shows that the tyranny of the majority is the identity. And so if you question that, you're actually questioning um, being Chinese or m being a member right. of your nation. And so in a way, just like you said, that the right is threatened, the Chinese Communist Party probably feels constantly threatened um, by, by the forces such, such as an author who's but willing to make a satire about it. And I wouldn't say that it's just in China. I would say around the world that somebody who's questioning something all of a sudden is becoming disloyal. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Daniel, what on earth is going on? Uh, so I would absolutely agree with the comments of uh, Elizabeth and, and Tricia. And I'll, I'll take a slightly different perspective, uh, as one might expect of a historian. I do f view things historically. And um, one of the things that, uh, struck me in the article uh, was, and first of all, I, I agree, it is in other places, there is a, a kind of uh, resentment of expertise, independence, nuance uh, abroad in the world today. And, and in fact, uh, you've had that as a theme on several of your other podcasts, uh, I note. Uh, but I want to talk about China specifically. And um, in some ways, this is not new to China. Uh, that, uh, and now I'm, for self disclosure, I am not a Chinese historian, but my work on historiography has occasioned me some familiarity with the history of the country, and I've been there several times. And uh, one of the things we in the West mistakenly assume, and we assumed this with, um, with Russia, I think, mistakenly and we've assumed it with a few other countries mistakenly, is that uh, democracy is some kind of natural thing that uh, enlightened people must always struggle towards and, and have, and if they're not doing it, it must be because of repression, and we can, we can help in various ways. And the history of Western intervention in these things is not always a positive one. In some cases, it is. I mean, you could argue that Western intervention uh, in World War II uh, led to the downfall of one of the most ruthless regimes in history, uh, the Nazis, a uh, very, very repressive society, uh, again, with a very, very um, non-individualist view of a totality. And, you know, I was quite struck by, as a others were about the six months of self-correction, which is the authoritarian state's version of you will write on the blackboard a hundred times, you know, I will yeah. not, uh, you know, I will Question. not do, do this again. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost uh, identical. We do not see that in, in the West uh, for, for the most part. Um, but there's a long history of it in China, which predates which predates communism. Um, the China has never had, except the brief period of uh, the republic prior to prior to World War II, uh, 1949, uh, has not ever actually really had democracy. It had ever since, uh, really since the third century BC, the landmass ruled by one of several different uh, dynasties. Um, authority exercised through a very, very robust and elaborate Mandarin culture. And um, uh, there was always a tension, for example, in historical writing between what was authorized by the empire and by the dynasty and what was actually done uh, unofficially. 
So it, it's not new, but I would say one thing is different, and I come back to the point that uh, I think Elizabeth made uh, in terms of the ability of people to act ethically has seems to have been pared away, and there's a lack of local accountability and a feeling that you have to, you know, listen to what the party says, as, as the party has in some ways almost become the modern Tao. Uh, uh, and, and there are no longer the various the various creeds, Taoism, Buddhism, and so forth, all of which have been swept aside by communism. And during the period of liberalization, we saw some changes in liberalization in terms of writing and so forth. But we have also now seen with the current uh, the current regime um, uh, a return to something more like a. Uh, uh, you know, with, with economic freedom to an extent, but more like uh, a, a sort of Maoist authoritarianism. So I just want to bring this back. I mean, I'm really glad we're talking about China because this is obviously at the heart of what this is. I mean, Yan Lianka has been uh, often said to be a potential Nobel Prize winner for literature, in part because he is a chronicle, a chronicler of contemporary China. And so he is looking at his country. He's not writing about Korea. He's not writing about Canada or South America. He's writing very much <coughs> about China. And to, to read this article and probably similarly to, to read his writing, we're getting a window into that culture, that civilization. But my question about this is that can the things that are happening there that we see through the eyes of this author and through the eyes of this journalist who's interviewing and, and you know walking along with Yan, Yan Lianka in, in his village, um, could... Are these things found in human nature or are they specific to China? And I guess in other words, are these things possible in, say, a Canadian 21st century context or are they quite specifically located in China today? Trisha. I th think the danger of this conversation is to um, just look at China and say, here are the good and bad things happening in China, but it's actually part of the, the world context in which all of this is happening. And uh, the ends justifying the means um, happening in many different cultures and also almost treating um, political systems like a religion. So if it's democracy, you can't question democracy. If it's communism, you can't question um, communism and because that's against the, the natural world order. But that that is happening everywhere as um, people are trying to strengthen their identity and um, gain new ground um, in the new political order. But I, I don't think what he's talking about is just specific to China. And that's probably why his books are well read in yeah. the rest of the world. They're relevant. Um, Elizabeth, you and I did a podcast episode where we talked about populism mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, the 2018 elections in the midterms in the United States, for example. And populism seems to be a global phenomenon. It does have aspects in China, but it is quite different there. Are there, are there parallels between what we're talking about with populism and, and this article and China? I mean, I actually, I think I probably like your original question better. I was just sort of thinking about it, like, yeah. can, could this happen here? Like, I mean, it's a sort of broader question, right, about, you know, the extent to which we sort of um, put the microscope on other societies and identify their pathologies and then, you know, sort of make a, a job. We can, we can make a whole industry out of critiquing those. And, and political science has actually done that a lot and has often been guilty of, failing to to turn the mirror towards itself i mean i think though that we are we are identifying as well the types of like you know negative behavior um repressive behavior sometimes like government repression is not unique to china and it's not unique to communist systems or authoritarian systems more generally right as well as the treatment of a dissenter <laughs> yeah right exactly yeah. Tr the treatment of a dissenter exactly i mean that's uh, a really great point um like look at what's happening for example and i'm not passing judgment one yeah. side or the other but look at what's happening to the so-called isis brides who are trying to yeah. come home right the dissenters yeah. are being stripped of citizenship and yeah. barred from entry so like that's an example where you know democratic states and um uh have their limits in terms of the 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 type of freedom that they're going to allow people ideologically politically personally etc well and those limits are being currently tested with that example you just cited i mean the United Kingdom, for example, is having ISIS brides come back mm -hmm. and has decided to revoke their citizenship. One of them 
is not only arguing that she should have her citizenship, but she's also saying that she's not at all remorseful of the acts and actions mm-hmm. that she took as part of ISIS. And she thought that the people that died as a result of her actions should have died. And that is testing the moral fabric of a country like the United Kingdom, which is already being tested in different ways with Through Brexit. Brexit. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think what we're seeing here in China, but in other countries, is a testing of the boundaries and therefore a redefining of them as well. Daniel. So, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree. And uh, I think it's absolutely true. I think it can happen anywhere. Look at McCarthyism. Uh, uh, it totally it's <laughs> happened in the States before, yeah. and, um, exactly. and uh, it, there's a long history of those who don't fit in or who dissent. Um, you know, Galileo had his views on, uh, you know, views on the way the cosmos worked, uh, house arrest, and, uh, and so forth. Long, and long, his- long, long history. As well with the um, indigenous people not even... Um, being able to have legal representation until the 1960s. Mm. That's a way of suppressing a voice in Canada. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, I think we sometimes take our, our democratic freedoms uh, somewhat, for, somewhat for granted. I mean, who, who would have thought in 1860 that Germany, the then most civilized country in the world, uh, would become, and in fact, I said exactly this on a previous podcast with you, Ben, would become, first of all, a militaristic imperialist uh, state leading up to World War One, and then uh, an appalling fascist uh, genocidal uh, state in World War Two, and then by 70 years later on would become the beacon of, you know, Western liberal democratic values in, yeah. Uh, yeah. in, in Europe, while you know, Britain and France and the U.S. are in the grips of uh, something considerably less than that. So these things, these things go through cycles. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that I do think there are very specific national cultures and local cultures that do do I think you guide a little bit how these things unfold in in different ways. So an authoritarian state in China is not necessarily the same thing as an authoritarian state in in Germany. It's not just and it's not just communism versus fascism ideology. I think it is very much part of national culture um, notions of obedience, a sense of where the family and society fit in. Uh, duty. One of the striking things about that that article is just how traditional um, his mother's life and his mother's upbringing was, uh, right through most of the Maoist and uh, post Maoist era. You know, I recognize that uh, while some of us have been to China, none of us are Chinese, none none of us are from there, which is part, I think, of the benefit of having this conversation because we can have a bit of objective distance from it. But I do want to bring up something that I learned a few years ago, which is that um, for centuries in China, one form of punishment is uh, corporate punishment, not corporal, not spanking, but corporate punishment, where if one person does something wrong, say murder or steal, the people who get punished are his family and his descendants. Even those who have not been born yet could be punished 50 years later for the actions that an individual takes today. Now, to a Westerner, that seems anathema to not only our values, but to just basic morality. That doesn't make sense for someone who's not even conceived yet. But it happened in Germany in the 1940s. <laughs> sure, right. In, in, but in what way, Tricia? That um, families would be affected um, by the actions, any um, dissenting actions of a family member could affect the entire family. And right. that, that was the incentive of... Um, uh, that kind of um, compliance. For example, if you uh, were found to have hidden Jews in your house, uh, your entire family could be subject to execution. Mm-hmm. Uh, entire families, if one member happened to be, you know, part of uh, some dissenting group, you know, could could happen as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that in in China, though, and I don't know if this is distinct, but your descendants could be punished. The people who are not yeah. born yet could yeah, be like punished. Yeah, like is something is what you guys are describing, although heinous, um, con- slightly different than what you're describing, right? Like this was done as a way of punishing or or retribution of the individual who had been, you know, like hiding the Jewish people or whatever the case may be. Whereas what you're describing is actually a system where responsibility is actually seen as fit at the family level rather than the individual level. And so it's not done necessarily to punish or gain retribution or, or to actually 
force compliance by the other family member. But it's actually just seen as a legitimate way of punishing. I think that's right. I, mean, I, I would I would agree that there's yeah. an important distinction there between the phenomenon and the assumptions behind the phenomenon. Right, and I guess yeah. my, and I, my, I only so raise that ahead. because it sort of goes with your earlier p- point about some of the national culture in China. So, like, not just obedience, but like the a very different orientation towards the individual and group level sort of entities. Mm-hmm. Right. So, like much more i mean it's a bit simplistic but more collectivist or communitarian sort of cr- or, communitarian yeah. um versus western especially anglo-american views right like the individualistic views that uh, that define our right society. like the person who does a crime or does something wrong is the one who's responsible and like mm-hmm. you wouldn't see i guess except for purposes of like blackmail or whatever you wouldn't see especially the state punishing like future children well i guess the only reason the state would do so is is uh, for utility like for example going back to the germany example um if i'm going to if i want to make sure that i get the jews out of your basement then i'm going to make it as uh, impossible as i can for you to refuse right whereas in china it's more of a moral code um, that your descendants will be punished because that's the way things are done. I think even in, in the Canadian context, for a wife to be punished for a husband's actions, which does have precedent in the law or vice versa, um, it, to us seems ridiculous today as we become more and more individualistic. There's a book called Selfie. I don't know if you've heard of it uh, by an author from Britain named Will Storr. And he essentially says that the further west you go towards the cliffs of California, the more individual individualistic you become. And that it goes from the essentially community values of China uh, all the way until you become the absolute sovereign person of California and uh, you know and and sovereign I think is a key word there there's no sense th- sense that Yan Lianka the author here has sovereignty over his writing he is a tool he is a servant of the state he's a servant of his literature but I, I, I'm going to challenge yeah, you on that because we're now in the 21st century and um, where various countries have gone through periods of isolation, whether it's China or the United States, um, we're now in a different situation with the internet and with um, social media. So if you take Ai Weiwei, he um, was dissenting against um, a number of things that the Chinese government was doing, including the Sichuan earthquake, where a bunch of buildings fell because of corruption in the the building codes. He ended up um, creating this... He, he created this installation on a German museum called Remembering with a quote from one of the mothers, and that became international. And so there, there's a way to protect oneself when you've got a world community um, to communicate with. If he is going to be nominated for a Nobel uh, Prize, he's been giving honor. And so there is pr- more protection for a dissenter in the 21st century than there would be in an isolist, isolationist culture. I think I think that's probably right, and uh, I want to go back to an earlier Chinese example. Of, uh, I noticed the article talked a fair bit about the Great Leap Forward from 1950 to 63. It didn't have very much to say about the Cultural Revolution, which was in many ways a direct yeah. consequence of that. The Cultural Revolution was inspired by one seemingly minor act of political satire. And it was a uh, a work written by a historian, a play actually, um, involving allegorically involving uh, the dismissal of a famous ancient general. And this was read by Mao and Madame Mao as criticism of uh, the regime post Great Leap Forward, and it. it basically set off what amounted to the Cultural Revolution, complete with the repression, the purges, uh, intellectuals sent off for re-education, <laughs> and, uh, and just really the disasters of Mao's last 10 years uh, in office. So the, you know, the, current, the current situation is, is worrying and oppressive and certainly uh, a, a grim case, but we, we have yet to see so far anything quite as quite as grim as the Cultural Revolution or the Great Leap Forward um, in the current regime. And I think Tricia is, is right that uh, the, there is an international eye on regimes, 
and it's not always effective. Um, obviously, there are some regimes. Uh, I don't think North Korea cares very much about yeah. uh, what people think. China is trying to engage with the world. Its redevelopment does depend in large measure on relations and trade with the West. So it can't be, despite the bluster, it cannot be completely impervious to, uh, uh, to what we think in other, part, in other parts of the world. Right at the beginning of our conversation, Trisha Baldwin, when she answered what on earth is going on, said that we are bringing in a new operating system. Now, what a great metaphor for understanding the incredible churn of our lives, the paradigm shifts that occur nearly every day, but also the choice that we have of what operating system to load into our, so to speak, computer. Now, coming up in this conversation, we continue to talk about Jan Lanka's work. We talk about dream walking and what it means to walk through life in a slumber when everything else becomes so absurd. But we also talk about just how much of a difference there is, if any at all, between China and the West and the way that we deal with things. Is the social media credit system that China is developing all that different from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the ecosystem of the internet that has come about in the West? All that's coming up in this conversation of what on earth is going on. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Cultural Revolution because there is something happening now in China that may actually be another great leap forward or backward or however we want to call it that is almost as uh, titanic of a change. And that is the so-called social credit system. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but not social credit like we had in Canada, but essentially a social media system uh, for classifying, targeting, and quantifying every single individual's behavior from day to day and using every single possible point of contact that you can find to track your movements, the things that you do. So if you go, for example, you, and you, there's a, I think this is in the Boston Globe, um, and they did an article which was really in-depth about what this means to a Chinese person today living in Shanghai, for example. You go into supermarket, you're having your, your, um, your carriage as you walk into the supermarket. You essentially get points that are hidden from you for all the fruit that you buy, all the things that you're encouraged to buy. But if you, say, buy something that is decadent and American, you will be docked points. If you buy alcohol, you'll be docked points. But if you go down the aisle that has socialist literature, you might get more points for that. If you jaywalk, you get docked points. If you, on your way home, help someone, you know, an elderly person into their home, you get points for that. But at the same time, if you, I don't know, don't, don't um, give a beggar money on your way home, you get docked points. Now, that's all pretty simple it's and understandable. But if Deontology is basically what you're talking about, a rule-based ethics. <laughs> that's right, but there's yeah. another aspect to this, which is that if you dissent of anything the government says or does, yeah. you will un most certainly be docked points. And now, what does this mean? Is it, is, what do these points mean? Well, these points can get you a job, but they can also prevent you from getting a job. This is being tested and rolled out as we speak in China in the west of China, where you have the Uyghur population, um, they are being categorized in this exact way as a test for the rest of the country. And their categorization is actually to the DNA. Like these people are being mm -hmm. genetically um, spied upon, essentially, and categorized by a totalitarian system. Now, this is happening. And, there, and I think going back to this conversation we were having a few minutes ago, is China unique in the, in the setup that it has to allow for these things? Because if some government in Canada, the United States, Britain, even Germany did something like this, I think there would be, I, I don't know if it would be possible in the current paradigm. Daniel? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure because, um, well, with the government, certainly, I think right now there's sufficient resistance. Uh, but if Facebook did it, maybe it's I was okay. just I was just going to say, but, you know, we resist anytime somebody from government asks for information. But we routinely put on you know, Twitter and Facebook, my birthday is this, and I like this and this and this. And, and here are that, pictures so of my children. And here are pictures <laughs> of my children. So we've we've given. About, I mean, what you're describing in China is, is I would say, uh, my my worst science fiction dystopian dreams of the last forty years uh, uh, come come true, uh, and you just pick pick your you know Brave New World, Logan's Run, yeah. you know whatever, uh, and it is scary that you know the AI of the time has brought us to where that is now technically possible. 
Um, the quest question I'm I'm struggling with a little bit is the one you asked, which is you know y yes we're doing it to ourselves perhaps with uh, Alexa and uh, Siri and so forth, but would would we allow the government to do this uh, to us? Uh, Canada, I think not. Um, U.S. I'm starting to fret a bit about. If you look at Margaret Atwood's book on Hand *Handmaid's Tale*, yeah. that um, so that could never happen. When I was reading it, and now we're in the 21st century, and with the Donald Trump government and that whole Christian coalition, I I think it's dangerous for any society to think that it could, that could never happen to us because we each have a responsibility and collectively have a responsibility for a fair society. But it can go away so quickly with it in action and i think the west challenge is in action well, i think it, too sorry, that, go ahead. like um i don't think we can say as well that you know governments uh you know it's private companies like facebook and so on and that governments aren't doing this i mean people probably remember the big um public debate that was, that was ignited when for example london england um you know started ins installing all the closed caption or cctv uh, cameras everywhere like you can yeah. hardly go anywhere in outside yeah. in um, central London without being captured and Paris <laughs> exactly right exactly and then the other thing that I would bring in which has become really interesting to me is that we are actually like not just Facebook like my birthday is and I'm in a relationship and here's my kids but like we're sending our DNA to companies right to like at least allegedly track our or or find information about our heritage however um, uh, what, I don't know, ancestry. inaccurate, exactly, ancestry or whatever, however inaccurate these may be. Um, but we're doing this and they're building big databases and, and, you know, the latest news is that, well, they're sharing them with the FBI, right, and, and other government agencies. So government right. doesn't need to collect data from us because we're giving data to everybody and they're getting it from them. Well, the Golden State Killer was a really yeah. interesting story, I think, uh, in 2018 where he was caught because of data that was collected by people sending off their DNA, essentially. Uh, and, and that wouldn't have been possible without this massive database. And now we think, great, I mean, you got the Golden State Killer. Yeah. But is, this also, is, is there a, a dark side to this silver lining cloud? Um, and I think it's a very interesting question. But I also think, is there a functional difference, really, between government and Facebook? I mean, it was said many, many times when fascism comes to America, it will come in American form. It will not yeah. be what you think of as yeah. fascism. Yeah. So when, if a social credit system were to, if it's not already being essentially imposed or is morphing into what it is, what is being built in China, does it really matter that it's government or not government? Does it, is it functionally at all, um, does it matter? I yeah. don't think it. I don't think it does. I mean, because for one, for one thing, sometimes the boundaries are not very, uh, not very clear between uh, the two, and governments can, of course, even try. I know Apple has resisted to, to, to clo disclosing information, but sooner or later, governments can uh, can force this. Um, and uh, again, your your line about fascism won't come, you know, in the same way it uh, did in Germany. But also remember, in Germany. Fascism didn't come by you know way of you know a big you know coup d'état or so forth. It was an election followed by a very very ra rapid but uh, unseen you know elimination of opposition political parties, uh, night of the long the knives. Um, so ev even there, uh, with with a lot of alliances from private business, I might add, who saw the Nazis as a bulwark against Bolshevism. So yeah, I think it uh, absolutely can happen and it can happen with with companies and and with with government the further thing is and again the nazi example is opposite all it often takes to get people to veer towards the we need more security we need protection we need the government has to have access to this is some major crisis or calamity is the Reichstag fire to some degree and uh, uh, in Germany and uh, 911 yeah. uh, absolutely look look what happened in 911 mm -hmm. department of homeland security um, you know at that civil uh, rights <laughs> yeah, yeah civil rights out the window mm -hmm. yeah you know. war measures act in canada yep yeah, uh, 1970s. 70s. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
declaration of a national emergency in the United States right now, apparently, you know, like government, even in, I mean, this underscores the fact that even in governments that we take to be sort of gold standards of established democracies, they have incredible powers at their hands to, you know, still do these things, right, to, to like, suspend normal laws in, in, in declaring a sort of a, the War Measures Act and so on. Well, and it's not just the powers that they have by law. It's the powers that we give them because they, we want them to protect us. So I would suspect that if you were to ask most Chinese people what they think of the social credit system, I think a lot of them would probably be in favor of it because of how it's packaged, because it doesn't come across as insidious, because you get points for helping an elderly woman into her home. Isn't that a good thing? Don't we all agree with that? And if you frame it in the right way, I think that most people would agree with, say, the Patriot Act, right? Yeah. If you just sell it and package it just right, and there's only going to be a few dissidents uh, in certain contexts. And I think that it's... So what I'm trying to get to is it's not just what's in the code. It's not just what's in the War Measures Act or in the law that prescribes um, the social credit system in China. It's what we as a populace are willing not only to allow, but what we want, what we're asking for. And if we want security, then we may ask for some pretty serious exchanges of our liberty. Go ahead. That kind of reminds me of the part in the article where he talks about um, in reality in China, but also in relation to one of his books, um, what is it, people being in this dream state yeah, or like yeah. zombie-like dream, sta- dream yeah. walking, right? Yeah. And how people, um, this happens in all types of societies and political systems, right? Rather than confront the thing that seems very amiss or very scary or that is wrong with you or your group or your culture or your your politics, it's easier to just go along and pretend that everything is okay, like to just accept you know, like the state repression or the surveillance or whatever and just comply, right? And it's sort of similar to an idea of like, um, you know, sort of lemming-like behavior or mob mentality or whatever. Like it's, it can be easier to just comply than to resist. Right. And, it, and it's very similar to this, what, what's called somnambulance, right? Right. This dream walking um, is not too dissimilar from holding a phone in front of your face and, and yeah. being essentially distracted yeah. from what's around you. And I'm just going to quote the article because I thought it's really um, insightful. Um, this is about The Day the Sun Died, which is the book about the dream walking that Jan Lianka wrote. The Day the Sun Died takes place during a single evening and night when a village called Geochin is stricken by an outbreak of somnambulism or dream walking. The night unfolds in an escalating series of calamities, suicide, murder, opportunistic looting, as dream walking unleashes buried impulses. Yan told me that he intended to probe the inherent falsity of life in China. Communism, he believes, made it impossible to express true feelings in conscious life, and therefore, Chinese people are not in the habit of doing so. Because information is so tightly controlled, generations of Chinese have been dreamwalking through life without realizing it, becoming zombies primed to live in accordance with state dictates. To be Chinese, then, is to live under enforced amnesia, a medicated slumber of propaganda." Sounds like the Matrix. I think it, yeah. also, it also sounds like Canada circa 2019. I don't think that's just China. There's something about the absurdity of our, if we were to accept our existence today, we might want to go back to sleep. With the algorithms that are feeding ourselves our own opinions and um, so that we can actually block out certain um, activities that are happening in, in the world mm. um, to feel safe but this artificial feeling of being safe and also uh if you even go back to the 60s and 70s people were empowered to change the world and it may have been arrogant to think we can change the world but people were out there i was part of the peace movement and so um that's what was happening but now i don't know if people feel as empowered to change the world so they're um maybe uh going into a self-imposed um isolation to to give the feeling of um being safe so i'm 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 not i'm not so sure about that i mean i actually i actually do understand where trisha's coming from on that because you know we are sort of you know uh, zombified by our iphones and uh and and so forth um but i i still see 
a fair bit of activism among the young. I mean, I mean, obviously, the big thing that uh, I think uh, the generation control. of my children are concerned is climate, climate, yeah. climate change, yeah. which is you know is an existential uh, threat. So I do think there is still a feeling among among a a constituency of you know not just the young but actually uh, more senior people in society that you can change things. And um, I'm, I'm a little more optimistic about this country, I have to say, than I am about other parts of the world so right you've, now. So you've said that uh, before as well. Why? Why is that? Uh, well, I would say the recent contretemps out of Ottawa uh, involving uh, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, SNC level and so forth, um, you know, is, uh, there has been great fuss about that, and we don't know how that one is, uh, is, is going to end. But I would say it uh, demonstrates the strength of our democratic institutions and the strength of the, uh, the open society that allows a newspaper to run a story that then leads to a high level of scrutiny of something going on in government. And we, we, we still, I'm not taking one side or other, he said, she said, and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, in, author, in an authoritarian society uh, with a zombified population, you would not have that kind of blowback. I mean, yeah. to me, it's incredible and perhaps heartening uh, in some ways that we're making this fuss about uh, SNC Levelin when people have become numb to the latest Donald Trump to the, uh, yeah, to, yeah. To, and, and it, it's no longer shocking to read, to read what he does. Well, if I could just uh, sort of piggyback onto that, I find it remarkable too, especially in the context, I mean, I... I don't mean to keep pulling it back to like government and systems of government, but well, you are a political scientist. I am a political <laughs> scientist, so that's what I'm going to do here. But it's also remarkable that first one and now two people in in the heart of the political executive in the country have become whistleblowers, so to speak, but still actually remain in, ca- in the caucus for now um, is, uh, you know, I think a good sign, right? So there's a lot of pessimistic news about what's happening or allegations about what's happening. But there is also an optimistic story about, you know, the system is functioning as it should, right? The the legislature's House um, Justice Committee sprung into action, has been interviewing people involved, right? So this is this is the system responding to alleged threats as it should. So I, I agree with what you're saying, but I'm going to play devil's advocate. I agree in the sense that it seems like it's a normal scandal in a world of abnormal crisis of scandal, right? So yeah. this ongoing circus of scandal yeah. in the United States is something that just never ceases to amaze us, and it's on the front page of every paper yeah. every day. But Whereas this scandal seems like a normal, run-of-the-mill government scandal that happens once every 10 years in Canada, and maybe it'll bring down the government, and that'll be a good thing, and then we move on, right? It's, yeah. it, it's normal as opposed to abnormal. But the devil's advocate is something that someone told me recently, and it made me think. And they said, Donald Trump, and not to suck the oxygen out of this conversation like every other one, but (laughs) Donald Trump's regime in the United States, or his government, or whatever you want to call it, has actually proven the effectiveness of American democracy and shown that it is resilient because he has not gotten away with what he's tried to. Now, I might disagree with that statement, but let me put it to the table. Is it, is it possible that the United States has become stronger as a result of resisting the attempts of this man who clearly loves authoritarian leaders and wants to be one himself and has said so? Is it, is it more resilient or is it becoming weaker as a result? I don't think we know the answer to that right. yet, Ben. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, we see so many counter moves. I mean, certainly the uh, change in the House majority was a positive step, but we don't know what's going to happen when the Mueller report lands. Uh, You know, uh, I would say I would be more confident of that if you'd asked in the context of Watergate 40 years ago. And uh, uh, that was a very clear case of you know Congress doing exactly what it uh, what it should do. I don't think Congress is is, is doing its job uh, right now, and largely because uh, the Republican Party has has lost sight of its legislative and oversight mm-hmm. responsibility. I want to echo that. I think the ma- one of the major problems that we have here is that the Republican Party, and like is shirking all responsibility that it has to the American people, to good governance, to upholding the Constitution, and has for instrumental reasons. You know, many of these senators are worried about their own seats or are, you know, riding a wave or whatever, um, are, uh, you know, just standing back and letting, um, you know, this 
person who is not competent for the job and is, um, in terms of character and um, experience, not set up for it, you just have his way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You had sure. asked about um, would this happen in Canada, and I think one um, strength of Canada is, if you even go back to the BNA Act, that we have protected different groups even back in the time where it was um, the victor's justice. So you can see that there's protection of Protestant and Catholic, um, French and English. So we actually started off as a multicultural nation which has different points of view and has a constant rub. (laughs) And I think we're used to that constant debate as not questioning whether we are a good Canadian or bad Canadian. You're actually expecting um, debate in the political arena. And I think that's been a very healthy thing uh, for Canada and if you just look at um, immigration in Canada and how it's been welcomed we've actually we started out that way maybe just with two cultures at that time but we we've actually been more successful with migration than other countries because we're not defining being Canadian as one religion and one skin color (laughs) right we we have a multiculturalism baked into us from the from the very beginning I mean, I think it's also easy because we get we are not adjacent to any immigrant sending con- country, yeah. and we have basically a geographic and political setup where we can hand select highly educated immigrants who speak one of our official yeah. languages using a point system and so on. So, like our position is very different than that of currently, like Italy, for example, which is like getting hundreds of thousands of of migrants, right? So it's like easy to have a successful, I think, multiculturalism program and policy and ideology in the country when um, the conditions around that make it, uh, you know, um, immigration and integration a lot easier. Well, and there's also the security guarantee, the the blanket provided by our southern neighbor as well. Yeah. That's true. I want to come back, though, to something you said earlier, Ben, which I, I do think does present a risk to us. And it, uh, again, has to do with uh, what I would call uh, the atomization of opinion into you know a thousand different streams and the ability, um, you used the phrase self-censorship earlier in the sense of censoring what you're writing and saying. I understand that. In some way, we are self-censoring what we're receiving. Anytime you mm-hmm. push block or mute on some opinion on yeah. uh, Facebook or social media or Twitter that you don't like, and you press like on the ones that seem to reinforce your, your views, you are, you are self-reinforcing your worldview, and it's very, very different from when we had, you know, three three news networks, and uh, and uh, there was at least a sort of common consensus on uh, on uh, what the news was and so forth. Now there's not even consensus on what the facts are. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's a very critical point, I think, about our state, not only of our democracy, but our media ecosystem and our echo chambers, right? It's not just blocking or muting, it's these these platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are designed to create the greatest possible engagement from every single individual. So how does it do that? Well, it's going to give you the stuff you want. It's going to make you angry yeah. and you're going to press the hate button or whatever. Yeah. And you're going to like the things that make you really joyful, like a cat video. Yeah. But it's not going to show you things Don't that you'd rather cat ignore. <laughs> no, I'm not knocking them. I, no, I said, I said press the like button. And I didn't, although I'm sure some people press the hate button when they see a cat video. And you know the hate button, like the angry face on yeah. Facebook. But um, I think that that's a really salient point because the, it's not, and, and it's not just us interacting with the platforms. It's how the platforms are built. There was someone on the Ezra Klein Show, which is a podcast about American politics, who said that, look, if you're going to be up in arms about all these problems that are happening on social media, don't forget they're doing exactly what they were designed to do. They are not disrupted. They are not malfunctioning. They are functioning exactly how they were built. This is what the internet is made for. So if you have a problem with it, you might want to go to the first principles of it. Now, we've only got a few minutes left, and I want to go to one final question, and I want to change tack here to a more philosophical point. We've been talking about politics. We've been talking about history and China and and the, the sort of the intercultural relationship between us, the United States, China, so forth. And I want to actually go to the very end of the article, and a question that Jan Lianka raises. So here it goes. Jan has always found this grave more impressive than the terracotta army in Xi'an. And the grave he's talking about are the, uh, the, the grottos near Liao, Liao Yang, where he's from. 
given this emperor what he needed in the afterlife had involved real killing. China in the Zhu area was a slave society. One horse was worth five slaves. And a human skeleton had been found here, likely that of a stable hand. There were also hunting dogs, and it seemed that no one had bothered to drug them. They were found under the chariots, and would probably have been buried alive or crushed to death. However, one dog skeleton was found not under a chariot, but to the side, its front paws outstretched, hind legs braced, body bent double with effort. This dog in particular moves Jan. He imagines that it was the smartest dog of the pack, the one that realized at the last moment what was happening. He can't decide whether the creature was blessed or cursed, whether it is better to be exposed to the reality of one's circumstances or to be anesthetized by ignorance. Now, this is the classic philosophical question, right? Do we want to know or do we want to not know? Do we want to engage with the world or would we rather go up onto our mountain and enjoy the fruits of life before we die? And I put it to you. is, he bl- is that dog blessed or cursed with knowledge in those final moments? Well, I can't help but think of a very good Canadian novel. I think it won the Giller Prize a couple of years ago, Andre Alexi, 15 Dogs, which is precisely about what happens when uh, 15 dogs uh, get human consciousness and the bet between two Greek gods is whether they will be miserable or, or happy. And I think it's I think it's left unresolved at uh, at at the end because several of them have quite miserable lives and deaths. So I think one has a a, pleas- a pleasant one. So <laughs> I honestly don't uh, don't know the answer to the to, to the question. But what's your answer in your life personally? In my life, I'd rather know. Trisha, I would rather know. Why? I would rather live a real life and in my own life is sometimes the most painful times or actually the most growing times and the most truthful times so I, I think pain is part of life hmm. mm. Elizabeth <laughs> okay, uh, I I mean to be honest I would rather be you know in, in the dream walker world right mm. like especially since what you're describing is a case where the dog at the end of his life faces this brutal truth right about you know what's happening to him and so he can't do anything about it anyway. So, you know, better to not know. Espe- well, especially in that final moment. I mean, yeah. it's almost like, you know, living living out your final days and being told what happens when it all ends or something. And, and uh, it's it's a horrifying prospect, but there is this tension. Like, you still want to know if you can I mean, know. it's kind of beautiful too, right? Because he knows, but he's still clawing and like trying to get out. Yeah. Like, so the resilience or the like... Yeah. Survival. The huh? drive to survive yeah. is there. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, and maybe there's a line in this that wasn't in the story, but could have been, which is that maybe there's a dog that got out and we don't know about because it was able to escape. It's gone. Yeah. So true. knowledge actually gave it the power to escape, which is inter- yeah. interesting because Jan Lanka, his whole story is... When he was a teenager, he started to read books and realized that writing was a way to escape his agricultural backwater circumstance, that if he could write, he could be noticed and he could get out. And that's exactly what happened to him. He joined the People's Liberation Army in 1978, the same year that the economic reforms started under Deng Xiaoping. Writing for him was an escape. So maybe that's why he sees this story with such interest. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, I think that's a fair point. So there is uh, there, there there is some optimism to the end of that story, pre- precisely in that uh, in that. And you know, I I mean, I I guess I I read the the story of the semi sentient dog trying to escape, uh, not as uh, so much a a fearful realization of impending doom, but rather a will to life and a will to escape. Mm-hmm. Which, in some ways, I think, is a metaphor for you know human human nature, yeah. against the odds. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. The funny thing about Jan, though, is that he, despite what what must be some resources or means, he never escaped China. Still, he stays. He stays, yeah. although he's well, he's much more read in the rest of the world because his books are not published in China. He, people, Chinese, have to, Chinese people have to go to Taiwan or Hong Kong to get his books, and upon returning, some of them have to spend seven days in detainment to explain themselves and why they have a book by Yan Lianka. But doesn't that speak to his love of China? Because if, if you're criticizing your nation, it'd be easier not to. <laughs> mm-hmm. so or easier to leave. Yeah, and mm-hmm. easier to leave. But he, 
he stayed, same with Dietrich Bonhoeffer in um, the 1940s. He had job offers with most prestigious international universities, but he went back to the lion's den. <laughs> but and this is also his subject matter. I mean, yeah. there's a line in the story where he says, you know, this is what he writes about and so this actually fuels his art so what does he do without it right yeah without yeah. the constant exposure to the you know he says a few times absurdity yeah. of life in modern china yeah the one he loves and the w and we have the full circle of emotions over the ones that we love and he he may love being in china and have a responsibility for it well, and by doing so and having such a, a, f a singular focus on that, it actually allows us not only to see China, but see ourselves, I yeah. think, yeah. in his story and in this story. Um, any final words before we call it quits to this particular conversation? Oh, thanks. Great conversation. Yeah, thank Great. you. Thank, thank you, you very everybody. much. Thanks. For more information about our panelists, about Yan Langke, and about everything that we discussed, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes and a way to get in touch with me on social media or by email to give me your suggestions for future episodes and for future guests. Now, your quote of the week is from Yan Langke, the writer that we've been discussing, and it goes like this. Reality is much more absurd and complex than any fiction. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein. And of course, this week, thank you to the Office of the Principal at Queen's University for giving us the space in which to record. Next week, we're honored to bring you a conversation with the host of CBC's Quirks and Quirks, Bob McDonald. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.